Hello and welcome to Unit 6 in our New Mexico History class. Uh, this unit should provide a wrap-up for the entire course. Um, it is the final unit. Um, we'll be covering the time frame between the Great Depression, so the 1930s, uh, up to the present in a certain sense, but really the uh, bulk of where we're, we're studying will end in about the 1980s, or early 1990s. Um, we'll be looking at some of the reasons that um, a lot of the romantic reformers that we were introduced to last time, uh, those people who um, came to New Mexico with the artist colonies and who wanted to preserve Nuevo Mexicano villages and preserve um, indigenous ways of life, those people um, and some of the ideas that they projected about New Mexico helped to facilitate some myths about the Depression early on. Um, the notion that New Mexico hadn't really been impacted by the Depression was a big one, um, mostly because it was already an impoverished place. Um, so poverty was already a problem. People looking at the situation said, well, you know, these people already know how to live like this. Um, so the Depression isn't really that big of a deal. Also, another issue was the disconnect between the reality that uh, New Mexico's people were connected to the larger national economy um, a lot of the time through migrant labor. Um, Yet the notions of the reformers were that, uh, you know, these indigenous people, these Nuevo Mexicanos, they live a pre-industrial kind of existence, meaning that they're not connected to the national economy. Um, that was part of the charm for a lot of the reformers. So that notion also kind of led to and perpetuated the um, misreadings of what was going on in New Mexico. Um, of course, not everyone felt that way, and those ideas didn't last long once the suffering of uh, you know, real people came to light. Um, people like Senator Dennis Chavez, who you'll read about, uh, worked hard to bring uh, funds to the state, not just for relief, but also for new infrastructure and for new job training, new jobs themselves. Um, he orchestrated a specific Hispanic New Deal. We'll also look at John Collier, who headed the BIA. Um, his first experience with indigenous people was kind of with that group that I'm calling the Romantic Reformers uh, in the Taos Pueblo. And a lot of his ideas created a, an Indian New Deal, as it was referred to um, at the time, to bring relief to the specific issues faced on uh, reservations. Um, some of the problems with his ideas uh, we'll study further in this unit, especially in the e-text, in terms of uh, how his ideas and his plans really fell short in the case of the Navajo people. Um, so that's looking at the, the decade of the Depression. We'll also look at how the Depression um, pushed and challenged uh, assumptions about um, immigration at the time and who had the right to be in the United States. Um, so think about whether or not the Depression made immigration uh, easier or more open, or if it actually put restrictions on it. Um, of course, restrictions had already been in motion by the early 1920s, but the Depression also had an impact um, at the end of the decade and into the 1930s. Um, then we'll, we'll spend a bit of time looking at Atomic New Mexico, the um, outbreak of World War II, the location of the Manhattan Project in Los Alamos, called Site Y at the time, uh, when it was still secret and unknown to most of the world. And uh, we'll think about why the project came here, what the implications for the world were that New Mexico is very connected to, but also what the implications have been for New Mexico and its people. What is the relationship between Los Alamos National Labs, Sandia National Labs, and the people surrounding it? Uh, Los Alamos is probably a starker case because of uh, of its location. Um, it's located right in the middle of Rio Arriba and Santa Fe counties, or in between, I should say. Um, places where um, historic Nuevo Mexicano communities continue to thrive, places where the, those villages that the reformers of the 20s and 30s were looking to save. Um, and Los Alamos has been both a blessing and a curse to this area. So um, we'll look at some of those people's, uh, the people who live in Rio Arriba counties, ideas about what Los Alamos means and what it's done for New Mexico. Um, then we'll look at civil rights movements. And so we'll kind of cover a bit of the same um, uh, chronological time in uh, 
that next chapter on civil rights movements, but then we'll move forward into the 60s and 70s and even into the 80s um, and look at the legacies of some of the more militant Chicano activism, which took place in rural New Mexico, led by a man named Reyes Lopez Tijerina, um, who organized the Alianza, um, we'll just call it Alianza for short, you can read the full name um, in uh, the e-text uh, and the other readings that we have for this unit. Um, so we're going to think about the different kinds of methods that different civil rights activists used. Um, we're going to think about the ways in which the state actually enacted violence against those who were um, advocating for their civil rights. And when I say the state, I mean the government and its various levels. Um, so something important to keep in mind is that there was violence on all sides. There were also various um, different groupings within each civil rights movement, so within the Chicano movement or the African American civil rights movements, for example, there were people who advocated nonviolence, most famously uh, Martin Luther King Jr., um, but there were also uh, Chicano leaders as well, um, even Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta that advocated for nonviolent kinds of protests and striking, whereas people like Tijerina were more militant. And so some of the questions to think about that, that I struggle with myself are when, if ever, is violence justified, um, for one? Was it justified in the case of Tijerina? Was it justified by the state as well? So we'll see the, the violence that the state enacted against Alianza and the people of New Mexico. Um, and what do we do about that? I mean, how do we, how do we stop that? How do we um, ebb the violence when at least from certain perspectives, it seems justified as a tool or a means of, of uh, gaining civil rights when there's no other recourse. Um, so again, just some thoughts to keep in mind. The last chapter um, will bring things kind of full circle. We'll look at the cases of some of the Pueblos specifically. Uh, we'll look at uh, the way that um, Taos Pueblo is able to regain the Blue Lake, one of its sacred sites. Um, then we'll look at the continued battle that the Jemez people are waging for the Valles Caldera, um, which I just saw a story uh, a couple days ago about the Forest Service opening the Valles Caldera up even more widely than it had been um, in the past. So that's something that's um, not welcomed by the Jemez people. Uh, then we look at some more kind of, um, I guess, success stories to see the resilience of Pueblo people and Nuevo Mexicanos following these various cycles of conquest and colonization, colonialism, uh, that we've looked at over the course of this class. Um, so there are things like Rock Your Mocks. Um, we're also going to look at the UNM Indigenous Peoples Resistance Tour um, that took place on Columbus Day last year to protest that day, uh, or at least the fact that it's still known as Columbus Day. Um, and so I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing what you think, as always, and learning from your insights on this uh, last period of New Mexico history that we'll be looking at in this course. Thanks for all of your hard work this semester.